First John chapter 4. The Bible reads, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereby ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the scriptures that you have given us to hold on to. Lord, for us to believe them, to trust them, and to live by them. I pray, God, even now that you would take hold, your spirit would do in liberty what he desires to do today in the hearts of your people. I pray, God, that you would uh, take my thoughts and set them aside. You would give clarity to the communication coming forth from your scriptures into the hearts of each and every one of us. Anoint my words, Lord. Anoint our ears to hear the truth as it comes from you, Lord, directly. And we'll thank you for it, and we'll give you all the glory for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Know the spirit of truth. Know the spirit of truth. We've been walking through 1 John, and the one thing that we've noticed is that this is a pretty doctrinally heavy book. And when it comes to perhaps memorizing scriptures, 1 John is, is more difficult of them. While you may look to the Gospel of John and find great simplicity and, and clarity to even a new believer as you read, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by Him, without Him was not anything made that was made. That's very simple language, very understandable, plain language there you find in John. But here at the end of John's life, you find it has changed a little bit where he's speaking now specifically and more intently to the believer. You'll constantly see him saying, Beloved, my brethren, 
Um, uh, these things have I written unto you that ye sin not. And that's a deep truth because we all understand that uh, no one sins. If we say that we have no sin, we've deceived ourselves. And yet the gospel writer is now in this epistle being more direct, being more pointed, being more firm with his language as he challenges the Christian to what I believe is a higher sense of living, a higher life. An eternal life, if you would. He is challenging the believer in this portion of scriptures to live as a believer ought to. And that's why you find that that, um, as we've been walking through this, there are a few portions of scriptures where he goes back about I and him and he and me. And uh, the the man does not sin, though he is a sinner. And all of these these truths as they bounce back and forth are, are confusing at face value without taking perhaps more clear scriptures and applying them to it. But I believe John here isn't trying to confuse you. He's not trying to write vague truths. Either he's he's giving deeper truths to the believer at this time. He wants you to know something. I don't know if you want to do it later, but you can go and you can type into a Bible search software just the word no. And you're going to find time and time again the apostle is saying things like, Herein know ye. Hereby we do know that we know him. Hereby we know that we are in him. Ye have an unction, and ye know all things. I'm not writing you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteous. We know that we have passed from death into life. Ye know that he was manifested. Hereby we know that we are of the truth. He's not trying to confuse us. He's trying to get us to know something. And he's even saying it in the past tense quite often to a believer who is perhaps maybe even a little bit more mature. He's saying, hey, you know these things. You know these truths. So don't get confused. Don't get mixed up on these things. And sometimes when we see a portion of Scripture that may seem a little bit contrary, or it's a gray matter, or it's something that maybe we don't quite grasp, we don't quite understand, we need to understand that the gray matter isn't in the Bible. The gray matter is right here between our ears. We are missing something in our understanding when we look at two portions of the Holy Bible, and we say these are contrary one to another. No, the Bible speaks in complete unity, one message, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Lord over all, who is above all, in all, and through you all. There is one message of the Bible, and when we think that there may be two in a portion of Scripture, the great matter is here. Best thing we can do is just go, okay, well, I know that time after time after time after time the Bible says, for example, Grace through faith is how someone would say We are born again by believing the gospel truth. But then what will happen is we'll go to something like James chapter 2, and he'll say, well, faith without works is dead. Thereby, you don't really have faith if you don't have works to go with it. And our minds start to rationalize these things, and we get confused and, and start entertaining thoughts that aren't really truth, that aren't really reality. No, the reality is, is that James chapter 2 is true. Faith without works is dead. But we are saved by grace through faith. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, how do you rationalize those things? Well, you take time to pray and to wait on God to open your understanding. And then you will go, oh, okay, James is talking about works that accompany salvation. And if you don't have works after you're saved, you're saved indeed, you're born again, but it doth not profit anything. Oh, okay, I understand. And in time, you'll begin to be able to rationalize to seemingly at first contrary scriptures. And in 1 John, this is no different. It's near the end of the Bible. It's it's a little bit heavier in doctrine. It's a little bit more pointed at the believer with firmness in order to get the believer on the right track. And so as we've been reading through this, we found that quite often the, the contrary ideas come from the fact that we will see it saying that there is a man that is not sinning. But that is actually talking about the spiritual man, the new man that is born again, and not the carnal man strapped down to a flesh. And that's where we had to always make the division throughout this portion of Scripture. We need to understand the old man and the new man. We have a few DVDs we can share that will go into that a little bit more. The Bible always talks about that same idea. It's how there is a new man born again within me that doth not sin. And yet there is a carnal nature and a flesh that lusteth to envy and is constantly kicking against the spiritual man, thereby sinning, 
Is it, is it a front to God? Amen. Well, we know flesh and blood doth not inherit the kingdom of God, so we don't need to worry about that when it comes to salvation. Why? Because this old flesh is going to fall to the ground, and my spirit's going to raise anew and be immediately settled in heaven forever and ever throughout all eternity. And that is when that exchange will take place. And that's how those two seemingly contrary ideas can be both true at the same time. So let's look in 1 John chapter 4 specifically. That was just kind of an introduction of where we have been. We're talking about in 1 John specifically in the beginning, the idea of trying the spirits. It's very clear that there are two spirits that are within the world. And the Bible in this portion of scripture talks about the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And it's clear which one would be the spirit that we would want to follow after. The Bible says in verse 1 here, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? Because many false prophets are entered into the world. We need to try the spirits to make sure that the spirits are of God. This portion of scripture talks a little bit more about the spirit of Antichrist. So in order to understand the spirit of truth, Keep your finger in 1 John chapter 4 and turn with me to John chapter 14. We're going to use the clear explanation given in John chapter 14 of the Comforter, of the Holy Spirit, and his ministry to understand the spirit of truth, who he is and what he does even now in this world. In John chapter 14... John chapter 14, we have three chapters here that where Jesus is preaching. And if you have a red letter version, most of John 14, 15, and 16 are going to be completely red because it's just Jesus preaching, just word after word after word after word because the red letters, they designate the words that Christ spoke while upon earth. Now, in my opinion, the whole Bible should be read, right? Because he is the word of God. But those are helpful, I find, sometimes, too. I have a couple of those where the red letters are in there. And you'll see right away that, oh, this is a lot of Christ preaching. What Christ is preaching on, I'm going to just extend what I talked about this morning, and that's the ministry of the Comforter. John chapter 14 says, Of the Spirit of truth, in verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth, him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Bible says of the spirit of truth that he dwelleth with the believer at this time, but he shall be in you. And that's how the spirit of truth relates to the Christian believer at this time after Pentecost. He dwells within the believer. He is the comforter, and that's my next point. He dwelleth with you at this time, but he shall be in you. And that's where the spirit of truth dwells. Verse 18 says this, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. So in verse 16, it says, I will give you another comforter. And that's with the capital, because that's the, that's the name of the Holy Spirit. One of the names he's given is the comforter. Verse 18 says, I will not leave you comfortless. This is Christ speaking as he, as he begins to explain to his disciples that he's about to leave this world. But he's not leaving it comfortless. So we see the spirit of truth dwelleth in you and is also a comforter. He comforts those that he resides within. Go to verse 26. It says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, just in case there was any confusion, God loves in, in this portion of scripture to really accentuate the truth by, by adding parentheses or adding brackets that confirm that the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The next thing that you see of the spirit of truth is that he teaches all things and brings all things which were taught of Christ into our remembrance. So that's his ministry. He resides within you, gives you comfort, takes the teachings of Christ and brings them to your remembrance at opportunity times. Whatsoever things the Bible says that Christ has said unto you, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring those things to our remembrance. We're talking about the spirit of truth here. Uh, look at uh, chapter 15 and verse 26. Chapter 15 and verse 26 says, But when the Comforter is come, <coughs> excuse me, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. The next thing we see is that the spirit of truth testifies of Christ. 
The truth here is that it was sent from the Father. It is the replacement for the presence of Christ upon earth when he dwelled in flesh, when he clothed himself, roped himself with flesh. He became that replacement as Christ went up. The Spirit is going to come down. He's going to teach the believer of all things, bring all the teaching of Christ to remembrance, and he's going to testify of Christ. He is going to give testimony to the living God, Christ Jesus, the Lord who has made flesh and dwelt among us. Look over in chapter 16 and verse 7. The next ministry of the Spirit of Truth says this, Nevertheless, I want to see how far I'm going, uh, 16 verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world. So see this. He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The explanation here. Of sin because they believe not on me. He's reproving the world of sin because they believe not on me. He's reproving the world of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. He's reproving the world of judgment because the prince of this world is is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it, so Christ is elaborating on the fact that he has more to teach of these truths. He has more to explain to them, though they cannot bear it at this time. He says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into some truth? No, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The ministry of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, is clear here. That he is reproving the world while bringing the comfort unto the saved unto the righteous. He is judging the world of sin, reproving them of righteousness and of judgment, while at the same time taking the saved and bringing all truth unto their remembrance in order that they might be empowered by it. He will glorify the Father, for he shall receive of mine. In other words, he will receive those same believers, and he will receive the truths at the hand of the Father, and impart them unto them, showing them clearly unto them, and bringing them into remembrance at a needful time. This is the ministry of the Spirit. He dwells in you. He comforts. He teaches and brings all taught things by Christ to our remembrance. He testifies of Christ. He reproves the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And he also is just that spirit of truth that brings all truth, speaking not of himself, but rather glorifying the Father through his ministry here. Now, recognizing those things, let's turn back to 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to get to learn a little bit more about the opposite. Because the Bible here is saying, try the spirits, whether they are of God. And there's a very specific example here of how we do that. The first thing we do is we ask the spirit if they confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And that spirit that testifies of the truth of Christ being born in the flesh, as it testifies in many passages of Old Testament prophecy, and is brought to full fruition in John chapter 1 and verse 1, where it says, God was made flesh and dwelt among us. That same truth is one truth that another spirit or that spirit of antichrist will not confess they will not touch that they will not confess that jesus christ has come in the flesh and we've encountered that at the door quite often we will use that question well do you believe that jesus christ was god in the flesh and that other spirit will never acknowledge that to the affirmative they will always deny that quite often you see that particularly in the cults the jehovah's witnesses or the mormons or other groups that take those truths and deny them outright and they will not testify of those things what we're seeing here, though, is, is the trying of the spirits in two different ways. Yes, we can ask that question, but quite often spiritual discussions and someone who is of a lying spirit will have ways of answering certain questions whereby the truth of what they're saying is veiled. And this is why, as the Bible says here, there are many false prophets gone out to the world. That is the warning. And the mark of a false prophet is, yes, they are lying. They are not speaking the truth. 
but they are a prophet nonetheless. And as a prophet, they are very convincing. They are able to convince themselves of truths that they portray to others and reveal themselves as if they're their angels of light. It's very convincing quite often these other spirits. So there's got to be other things that we look to. The spirit of error. Look at this. The spirit of truth dwelleth in you. Look at John chapter, or 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they have God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So while the spirit of truth dwelleth in you, the spirit of error is gone out into the world. You see, it resides in a different location, whether it's in you versus in the world. Verse 3 continues, it says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is what? In the world. And verse 4 continues and says, um, verse 5, sorry, it says, we are of God, and then it says, they are of the world, in verse 5. Therefore speak they are of the world, and the world hear them. So many different ways, the contrawise is showing that the spirit of truth dwelleth in you, believer. The spirit of error is gone into the world. It's in the world. It's in the world. It's of the world. Very different home, wouldn't you say? There's a difference between it dwelling within a believer, that spirit of truth, and the spirit of error that, in fact, dwells in the world. Its abode is in the world. God is not the author of confusion. The spirit of truth, we saw, comforts. It's a comforting spirit. It brings comfort to those that are seeking after that spirit. Let's look, uh, keep your finger there, and look in Acts chapter 19. We'll just look at... One example of how the spirit of error acts. Not by comfort, but by confusion. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that God is not the author of confusion. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 23, it says, At that same time there arose no small stir about that way. Well, what way? That's the way of Christ, the way of the Christians. Verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, we know by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made of hands. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificent magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and what? The world worshipeth. So here we have the Apostle Paul being brought into contempt because he is preaching of the spirit of truth. He is preaching all things that Christ hath brought into remembrance. And the spirit of error, the spirit of the world, has worldly things on its mind and it's worked into the hearts of these craftsmen that, hey, if he keeps preaching this, we're making statues for them to bow down to. We're making idols for them to worship. We're making little beads for them to put around their necks and to pray for. We've got this great wealth that comes because of our ministry, which is to deceive people into thinking that this Diana is a god. But in reality, the Apostle Paul is true when he says, there be no gods that are made without hands. Nonetheless, that spirit of the world brings up what it says in verse 23. No small Stir. Verse 28 says, And when they had heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is the Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And the whole city was filled with confusion. And then they gathered together all those that were preaching within Paul's companions, and they bring them in to be judged. They bring them in to be destroyed. Verse 32 says this, Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused. The spirit of truth comforts. The spirit of error confuses. To the point where the whole city was filled with confusion because they were against what was being preached. 
because their worldly carnal lusts were being endangered by the truth that was coming in. The city is swept up into confusion. They have this great mob crying out, great is the Diana of the Ephesians, to the point where it says in verse 32 that some were there and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. They're so confused. They're at this great rally crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. A lot of them don't even know why they're there. They don't know that this was all caused by the Apostle Paul. They just see a group of confused people. Her mentality takes over. That spirit leads them to just all get together, shout and scream, and not really even know why they're doing it. It sounds like any rock show. It sounds like any, uh, any pep rally. It sounds like any, any kind of spirit of the world, spirit of error, and what happens when that spirit takes hold. <clears throat> like it says in verse 32, there was no remembrance. So that's another way that we contrast the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Spirit of truth brings all things that Christ hath taught into remembrance. The spirit of error does not bring any remembrance. People are confused. They don't even know why they're there. They don't even know why they're angry. They're nonetheless swept up with that Spirit. <clears throat> you can go back to 1 John now. Go back to 1 John. That was just an example of what happens when that spirit of error takes over an assembly. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 4, and verse 3 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come even now. Already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And verse 5 says, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. So while the spirit of truth confesses, testifies, brings to light truths about Jesus Christ, and is constantly in testimony of Christ, Glorifying him, the spirit of error will not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. There's a direct contrast. It will not confess the true Christ that was born of a virgin, the true Christ that came, true Christ that came down and lived that sinful life, the true Christ that fulfilled prophecies, did great miracles. That spirit of error will not testify of the truth of Christ. It confesseth not that Jesus Christ. What does it do rather? To the contrary, it speaks of the world, as it says in verse 5. It hears the world, speaks of the world, the world hears it, and it just constantly is reinforcing the world, talking about the world, lifting up the world, preaching of the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The world loves hearing about itself. The world loves lifting up itself. But it's in vain, because verse 4 says, Greater is he that is in you, believer, than he that is in the world. But nonetheless, we see that great divide. We see that contrast. We see that the spirit of truth it dwells in us, while the spirit of error dwells in the world. We see that the spirit of truth comforts, and the spirit of error, it just confuses. We see that the spirit of truth teaches and brings everything that was taught of Christ to our remembrance, the spirit of error. There is no remembrance with it. It's confusion. It's misunderstanding. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a, a messed up spirit that will not allow for the truth of Christ to be pressed forth. It testifies of Christ, the spirit of truth. While the spirit of error will confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The spirit of truth reproves the world while the spirit of error reinforces the world builds up the world, encourages the world. But we know that greater is the spirit of truth that dwells in us and the spirit that is of this world. And these are just many different ways that we can see and we can try the spirits. We can understand that there's a very different thing. But the interesting thing is quite often you will see um, the same outward shows from them. Well, why? Because at the end of times, the Bible talks about great signs and lying wonders and miracles being done by the false prophet. And many of them are similar to those the, of the spirit of truth. We saw that in uh, the book of Exodus, if you've ever read it, that the magicians, the soothsayers, they were able to do a lot of the same miracles that Moses did by the hand of God. Why? Because it's just a lying sign and wonder. And quite often those lying signs and wonders are enough to convince somebody, hey, well, let's fall after the spirit. That was a great miracle. That was a good thing. And this is why, though, 
that the Bible here and the Apostle John is reinforcing the fact that yes, there are many false prophets gone out into the world. You need to be able to try the spirits. You need to be under, able to understand if you're dealing with the spirit of truth or if you're dealing with the spirit of error so that you are not swept away with the error of this world and you're not destroyed by the errors of this world as that spirit is constantly fighting for your attention, fighting for your heart's desires. So why is it important that we know, prove, and try the spirits? Again, I just talked about this briefly. It's because there are many false prophets gone out to the world. And if you are not in the know, if you are not in the business of proving and trying spirits as you encounter them, you are susceptible to being deceived by these false prophets. Ye are of God, the Bible affirms in verse 4. And greater is that spirit that is in you than the spirit that is in the world. But that doesn't mean that that spirit cannot overcome you in the carnal aspect. Verse 4 says, you're of God and have overcome them. So your position in Christ is one of an overcomer, a believer. You are saved, blood-bought on your way to heaven. But that doesn't mean that a spirit of error cannot enter into your life and mix you up and get you in troubles in the flesh. And that's why we need to beware. Too often, we, we receive of a spirit and we accept it based on what we see. And we don't go to the point of trying the spirits, proving whether they are of God, and therefore we get deceived. And you'll find this quite often in different Christian rings where when, when something exciting happens, we've seen it in Baptist rings, where, where uh, someone stands up and they shout and they testify, everyone's running around. I don't know if you've ever seen some of these crazy camp meetings and everyone's yelling and screaming and shouting and, and, and this spirit takes over. And if you were to just walk in, you, you would be like, this is strange, this is unusual. But because they're swept up in the emotion of it all, they will say, this is the spirit of truth. This is the living God. You'll see this in uh, charismatic cycles where people are rolling around on the floor barking like dogs. And because they're all doing the same thing and they're all running the aisles and they're all behaving in the same fashion, they affirm what is happening and the feeling within their heart and say, this is of God, this is a great thing. Look at I'm speaking some foreign language, gibberish, no one understands it but, but the angels, and, and there's just this pandemonium, this excitement that happens. I'm sorry, but, but both cases, whether you're a Baptist or you're a charismatic or, or whatever, or you got a big rock show going on at your church, you are swept up with the spirit of air. That is the same spirit that swept through that city and had everyone in confusion, nothing of Christ being brought into remembrance, but rather everything is worldly, carnal, sensual, and devilish. And that is why we need to understand that there are spirits that need to be tried. We need to know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, and we need to be able to discern, we need to be able to walk after the spirit of truth. The spirits are known by those that are known. Look at this. Verse 6 says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby, we, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So if you are of God, you know God, you are going to hear what the Bible says is us, which is simply the writings that are happening right now. You are going to hear the spirit of truth because you know God and you are of God. If somebody does not hear the same truth, which is contained in the scripture, which is of the spirit of truth, bringing to remembrance all things whatsoever I have taught you, then you can mark and know that that person is not of God. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You are going to be able to see, you are going to be able to tell. You need to know God and not the spirit of this world. You need to know the spirit of truth and not the spirit of the world. The world passeth away, folks, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. Amen. We preach these truths because we don't want you to get trapped by the world. The Apostle John is preaching this truth because he doesn't want his beloved 
those ones that he loves, the ones that he's writing to, ministering unto, to be swept away with the world, to be swept away with false prophets, whether they're lying, divining, whether they have signs, wonders, miracles, whether they have a bigger church, whether they have better snacks, whether whatever the world will use to draw somebody away, the world will use it. The world is going to speak of itself. The world is going to preach of itself. It's going to reinforce itself. And you're going to see very clearly that the carnal mind that we all have a part of us, the carnal flesh that is a part of each and every one of us, believer, is attracted to those things. There's, there's no way to, to deny that. I sit in a room to this day. We don't have a television at home. But if I sit in my dad's living room, that television is going to suck me in, and it's just like Teenage Josh is all over again. I'm just, I'm watching television. All the smut, the filth, the garbage, the, the advertisements, I'm just, I'm sucked right into that. It's not because my spirit isn't vexed by it. My sinless, perfect spirit isn't going, oh, that's disgusting. Josh, leave the room. That's filthy. That's gross. It's because the power of the flesh is such that when I look at that, my flesh goes, yeah, that's good. I want to eat that. I want to try that. I want to, like, flesh just loves to just feed itself, help itself, benefit itself. That, that's, that's, the, that's the thing about the flesh. Thereby, we need to understand what spirits we are interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can put off the spirit that will attract our old man and we can put on the spirit of truth and make that conscious decision that we are going to make decisions for truth, we're going to make decisions for righteousness, and that needs to be a moment-by-moment -moment basis, a moment-by-moment -moment decision that we always have to make. So within the context of this scripture, we just found that the two spirits are clearly laid out, what the spirit of truth is and what the spirit of error is. The spirit of truth is the one that knoweth God, Heareth God, heareth those that are of God. The spirit of error doesn't hear a lick of God, doesn't, doesn't care about God. Only cares about the flesh, the world, the world. It's of the world, it's in the world. That's the spirit of Antichrist, the Bible says here. The purpose of this all and within the context is highlighted there in verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So the purpose of knowing what spirit you're of is that you would have care for, your goal would be, your purpose would be directed to knowing that spirit of truth. And when you know that spirit of truth, what is exhibited from you is love one for another love for the brethren because that same spirit has that same love that same spirit is of the father it's of the truth it desires to fellowship with people it desires to love people it desires to draw believers unto the truth just like the holy spirit the comforter his whole ministry was was to draw people unto the truth give them the truth of all things that same truth that same love that god gives to the spirit that dwells within you is meant to be sent forth. Love, the Bible says, or charity covers a multitude of sins. The Bible says that love or charity never faileth. The Bible says that love is the fulfillment of the law. The Bible says that that abideth faith, hope, and charity, or love, but the greatest of these is charity. And so this is the ultimate purpose of a spiritual man being yoked up with the spirit of truth is to the end that they would love just like the spirit of truth loves. And they would exhibit that same love. So Christian, let us love. Verse 7 says, love is of God. It says, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. What this is telling me is that if you're not born of God and you don't know God, you don't love. You're not of love. That's a, that's a weird thought because we talk about love all the time. A, a holiday just passed, Valentine's Day. It's all about love and love and love. But if the people that are practicing Valentine's Day are not born of God and they don't know God, 
they're not loving. There's a very different thing between the love that's being talked about and being exhibited, being performed, and being commanded even in these pages of scriptures and what the world calls love. What the world calls love is lust at best. The world calls love is to satisfy what's of the world. That same carnal, antichrist mind. That same flesh that we all have. That same flesh that is constantly kicking against the spirit. That's not love. That is simply somebody exhibiting some sort of feeling towards somebody else. Pushing some sort of feeling that somebody else might experience it from me. But it's all to the end that my flesh would be gratified. That I would be satisfied. I make somebody feel good. Oh, well, that's loving. But in my old man, in my old flesh, all I'm really doing is trying to love somebody in order that I would get something back. That's not love. The Bible is clear here. It says, love is of God. He that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So if you don't know God and you're not born again, you don't love anything. You don't love anyone. You love yourself at best. You, you are full of self. You are full of flesh. You are full of the carnal mind that just simply wants to please self. <coughs> the Bible is clear. True love only comes from God. Why? Look at verse 8. It says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? Because God, for God is love. So, what we call love is quite often just affection. What we of the world call love is quite often just lust. It's quite often just attraction. It's quite often just fancifulness. It's just, it's just a feeling. It's just some sort of emotion. It's just something that we, we build up, we well inside of it. It's something that it's in, our, it's in our heart, which is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But true love is God. God is love. And if you are going to exhibit the love of God, if the love of God is dwelling in you, if the love of God is going to be shown forth from you, the Bible is clear. You've got to be born of God and you've got to know God. You need to be birthed by God. You need to enter into that born again experience, that exchange whereby my dead flesh, my dead spirit are quickened, alive, born again anew. Just like Jesus charged Nicodemus, he must be born again. You need to be born again if you're ever going to exhibit the love of God. Otherwise, it's just fake. It's just phony. It's just an attitude. It's just a feeling. It's just a front to try to satisfy myself. You need to be birthed of God. You need to be in relation. You need to know God. You need to know what he teaches. Know what he desires. Know what he wants for your life. Know what he commands. Know what he wants you to experience. Know what he doesn't want you to experience. Know how he wants you to act, think, look, behave. And all that's contained within the scriptures. It's the word of God which sanctifieth. We learned that earlier. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And if we don't know God, well, how dwelleth the love of God in us? That's right. The Bible's clear. Verse 7, verse 8 here. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Prerequisites. You must know God. You must be born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. You can go and pen John 3.16 beside this. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. Romans 5 verse 8 is another one. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us these are all verses including the one that we just read where God is manifesting his love toward us he is making the first step of love toward us he is proving his love toward us by that same redemptive act whereby he sent his only begotten son to be the savior of the world God initiated love. God is love, of course. Uh, he, he had that same love. He was that same love. He is that same love before this world was even uh, a, a speck of a glimmer of a thought in his mind. Long before the world, God is love. Long before you and I have stood here, God is love. Even 2,000 years ago is a long time in our past, whereby God proved his love toward us 
coming to this world, living the perfect life, yet dying shamefully despised, rejected upon a cross, in order that he might be the substitutionary sacrifice, taking upon himself all of my sins as proof, as commending, as the reality, the present truth, that he loved me enough to do so. The Bible says that the Father sent the Son to do that. And that was his great act of love toward us. God is love, the Bible says. So how do we think that Hallmark is going to manufacture that? <laughs> how, do, how do we think that, that, that roses in a box of chocolate is going to somehow perform that same thing, that same task? How do we think that, that bringing someone flowers? Hey, these are all nice gestures, but it's not love. It's not love. It's, it's acts of a lovingness, maybe. It's, it's kindness. It's compassion. Love is of God. And the world goes and tries to exhibit love, and they fall flat. Why? Because love is selfless. Love gives entirely of itself and wants nothing in return. And the only reason that carnal, fleshly sinners like myself ever do those types of things is to get something back in return. Let's be honest. We gratify flesh by loving somebody else. And it's not true. It's false. It's fake. The only love in the world is God. And God, praise, praise God, praise glory, He decided to enter into this world and be love in this world through His redemptive act, through how He gave of Himself, through how He ministered to others, through how He healed, He helped. He is the propitiation for our sins, as it says in verse 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That was his entering in into our world. That was the bringing of love for the first time we ever experienced it, was that Christ came to be that sacrifice for the world. <clears throat> so, this love is eternal. It's everlasting. We already said that. This starts in the beginning. It starts in the end of the world, but beyond that because God is beyond those things. Verse 10 says, herein is love. This is God acting that out. This is the same thing that we beheld when we saw in John chapter 17. God's doing his great deed upon this earth in order that his love would be in him and he in the Father and that same love would abide in us and go forward into the world. Verse 11 said, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And this is the purpose and the end of God's love. The whole reason why he sent the Comforter unto us was, yes, it was the end. There was the fruition of Christ's ministry. He came as love, embodiment, lived that perfect life, died on the cross, but it was expedient for him to rise again and to send the Comforter. The Comforter comes, and as God so loved the world, we also ought to love one another. Well, the Spirit of God is now dwelling in us. And so now there isn't just Christ loving, being love, exhibiting love, true love that is, is, is of God and is in the world and is and knoweth God, but now there's little bits of Spirit of God everywhere. God's everywhere in the believer, and that love now can really show forth. That love now isn't just constrained to Christ as he walked, talked, breathed in that little area of Israel, but now the love of God is shed abroad in all of our hearts. We ought to love one another also. Verse 12 says, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And so, since no one has seen God at any time, since no one has seen the Father at any time, God commendeth his love toward us by sending the Son, who we can see and be held. Who, who the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, whom our eyes have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. They beheld Christ. They beheld God. They held God in the flesh. And now... Again, that charge goes forward where no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And that is the purpose of, first of all, us understanding we need to be of the spirit of truth in order that we can allow people to see God. And how would people see God? Well, they'd see it in me. They would see it in you. They would see it in the believer as they go about 
following the precepts of God, loving one another as he commanded, being sanctified by the truth, and being that spirit of truth upon this world. That's the ultimate and most important part of the ministry of any believer. Verse 13 says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Is that not the ministry of reconciliation? Is that not us going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature? As we go and we tell them that Jesus is the Son of God, that he dwells in us and he can be in you, that if you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. That if you have seen us giving the love of God shed abroad, you've seen Jesus Christ himself because his spirit dwells in us. And that is the ministry whereby this whole book has brought that same charge to us. Remember it said in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The whole purpose here, and it says again in verse 4, it says, And these things write me unto you that your joy may be full. John is writing in order that we may have fellowship one with another, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. And I'm writing unto you, believers, that your joy would be full. What is the charge here? That you would grab a hold of, that you would be indwelt by, that you would be empowered by the spirit of truth, and that spirit would drive you to love as God loves. That spirit would drive you to be Christ on this world when there is that void of Christ not walking and talking and breathing and living here as he did 2,000 years ago. The purpose is that the love of God would constrain our hearts in order that we would be God unto the lost neighbor that we have. We would be God unto our lost sibling. We would shed abroad that same love, for God is love and that spirit resides in us. We would shed abroad that same compassion because the spirit of God is one of comfort, is one of care, it's one of love, it's one of needfulness. We would shed abroad that same truth as we walk and testify of him with that same spirit of God testifying Christ in us, the hope of glory, as we try to preach that gospel unto people to the end that they would believe. We have known, verse 16, and believe the love that God hath towards us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So God is dwelling in you because you are dwelling in his love, because you have chose to dwell in this love. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, complete, entire, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Our love is made perfect when that fellowship and fullness of joy come to the uttermost. When they are both met within the Christian. When we know God and when we are known of God and when our fruit abounds unto life eternal, we're preaching the gospel and we're getting people saved and leading them in the paths of righteousness. And when we ourselves are walking in righteousness. When we are filling the great commission and when we are walking the talk that comes out of our mouth at the same time. Because there are many people that can preach the gospel, but they don't live of the gospel. They don't do what is right when they're not out soul winning, when they're behind closed doors. But our boldness comes, like it says in verse 17, when we stand in judgment and stand in the judgment of God and when we are rewarded for all the work that we've done and labor that we've done upon this earth. Our boldness comes when we can stand in the judgment with our heads held high, hearing the Father say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We are, we are bold to stand in judgment as we receive great responsibility in that which is to come, the world which is to come. And we are boldness, we are bold when we stand in that judgment and God has respect unto the offering. He has respect unto the works that we did with the right heart and with the right mentality. The only way that we can do this is to live out the complete, the perfect love of God. And here is, herein it is made perfect when we stand boldly in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. And how was Christ in the world? He was in the world. 
No doubt. He walked, he talked, he breathed, he associated, he preached, he did miracles. He is in the world. But our charge is to be as he was in the world in the same way. And we can. We have the Spirit of God in us. We can do great exploits. We can preach the gospel. We can teach. We can minister. We can love one another. We can love even as God loved. We can choose to be defrauded. We can choose to be put down, mocked, ridiculed. We do all the things that Christ has through Christ which strengtheneth me. And we can do it with boldness, knowing that we will stand justified before God. And we can do it without fear. Verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, complete love, the love of God, God that is love that dwelleth in us, perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And that is the truth. Fear is just going to stifle. It's just going to stump. It's just going to push down the love of God that you have in you. You need to be bold. You are living with the living God within your heart who is exhibiting that same love, who is doing what he will within your life if we let him. There is no reason to fear. There is no reason to doubt. There is no need to worry because that same love of God will expel that fear. We love him because he first loved us. We keep his commandments because he first gave them and then gave us the power to perform them. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, so quit being afraid in love. We love him because he first loved us, and because he first loved us, we have the ability to exhibit that same thing. We can do it without hypocrisy. Verse 20 says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? This is the commandment, and this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So the first bit of piety that we need to show towards others is when we love our brother. God loves the brethren. God loves the believers. We saw that in John chapter 17 as he prayed for the believers, not for the world, but he prayed for the believers and those that would believe because of him. And he wants that love to be exhibited within his own people. But God isn't here. Jesus isn't here to, to hug a brother that's down. Jesus isn't here to encourage somebody who's in a tough time. Jesus isn't here to, to help financially. Jesus isn't here to help feed, to help care, to help men, to help, to help encourage. He's not here. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time, right? But we saw Christ. But that was 2,000 years ago. We don't have that now. Well, what do we have? We have the spirit of truth dwelling within the believer. And that same spirit of truth is the same spirit that Jesus was of. It's the same spirit that the Father was of when he looked upon the world, recognized that they needed a savior, savior and commanded his love toward the sinner and died for them. Sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Our love toward our brother needs to come from that same place that the love of God comes from. So we need to first show that love. As he first loved us, we take that love and we show it forth unto others. And we can be the one that first loves somebody else. Just as Christ first loved me and became my Savior, I can first love the lost person at the door. I can first love the guy that's cussing at me and threatening to hit me. I can first love my wife. I can first love my family, Amen. my children. I can be that first love that exhibited and that somebody would love him because I first loved them. Right? I am being the vessel unto honor that the Father wants to work through. When I go and I show forth His love unto everybody. When I go and show His love unto the lost. When I go and show His love unto whosoever I come across. I love the world, just like I said in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. God so loved the world that He gave. Josh needs to so love the world that He also gave. He needs to give of himself. He needs to give of the fullness of his heart. In that same loving attitude, he needs to start with my brother. Why? Because I haven't seen God, but I've seen my brother. And my brother has the spirit of God dwelling in him. And I can go and I can love God. I can hug on God. I can help God. I can lift up God, encourage God. That is dwelling within my brother. 
Remember how the Bible says, as ye have done to the least, so have ye done unto me? <laughs> People were like, well, you know, Jesus, I, I uh, you know, why are you saying that I never helped, I never cared for, I never, I never did good things towards you? And Jesus' response was, well, because you didn't do them to your brother. And as you have done unto your brother, you have done so unto me. And that is why it is so important that we need to start from the foundation of trying the Spirit. Because that false, lying, devilish spirit of carnality can enter into us. And my love will just be an exhibition of me trying to gratify my own flesh and just do what the world thinks is love. Which is more often, like you said, lust. It's more often a feeling. It's not right. It's a fraudulent version of the love. But if I know that spirit of truth, and I'm connecting my heart, yielding myself unto that spirit of truth, then God, who is love, is able to work his love through me, and I can become that one that first loved, so that others would love God in return. I can be the one that first preaches the truth, the gospel, brings all things to remembrance, so that somebody can be edified and encouraged in the truth towards God. I can be that vessel unto honor, fit for the master's use, because I made the choice to do it. I saw two spirits. I saw two roads. I saw two ways of going about my life. And I chose the right. I didn't get busy, encumbered about with much business like Mary. Martha, sorry. But rather, I chose that good part. Yoked myself up with the Spirit of God. Heard His truth as Mary did. Sat at His feet and became that vessel unto honor. That vessel that loves the world. That loves my brethren. And therefore, I became like God in somebody's life. Because God isn't here to do that same. Instead, he chose to put his spirit in me to go and do his works for him. This is commandment that we have from him, that whoso loveth God, love his brother also. And that's the charge. That's the command. That the spirit of God work the love of God in me, that I could love my brothers in return. And be the love of God to them. That's my ministry here upon earth. It's the ministry of each and every believer. We need to set our minds and set our hearts to a truth like that and exhibit it. Throw out what the world calls love. Embrace the God that is love.